Chapter Seven of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume Two, by Havelock Ellis. Chapter Seven. Conclusions, Part Two. In such a case as this, one can do little more than advise the sufferer that, however painful his lot may be, it is not without its consolations, and that he would be best advised to pursue, as cheerfully as may be, the path that he has already long since marked out for himself. The invert sometimes fails to realize that for no man with high moral ideals, however normal he may be, is the conduct of life easy and that if the invert has to be satisfied with affection without passion, and to live a life of chastity, he is doing no more than thousands of normal men have done, voluntarily and contentedly. As to hypnotism in such a case as this, it is altogether unreasonable to expect that suggestion will supplant the deeply rooted organic impulses that have grown up during a lifetime. We may thus conclude that in the treatment of inversion, the most satisfactory result is usually obtained when it is possible, by direct and indirect methods, to reduce the sexual hyperesthesia which frequently exists, and by psychic methods to refine and spiritualize the inverted impulse, so that the invert's natural perversion may not become a cause of acquired perversity in others. The invert is not only the victim of his own abnormal obsession, he is the victim of social hostility. We must seek to distinguish the part in his sufferings due to these two causes. When I review the cases I have brought forward, and the mental history of inverts I have known, I am inclined to say that if we can enable an invert to be healthy, self-restrained and self-respecting, we have often done better than to convert him into the mere feeble simulacrum of a normal man. An appeal to the pederastia of the best Greek days and the dignity, temperance, even chastity which it involved, will sometimes find a ready response in the emotional, enthusiastic nature of the congenital invert. Plato's dialogues have frequently been found a source of great help and consolation by inverts. The manly love, celebrated by Walt Whitman in Leaves of Grass, although it may be of more doubtful value for general use, furnishes a wholesome and robust ideal to the invert who is insensitive to normal ideals, among recent books, Iolaus, an anthology of friendship, edited by Edward Carpenter, may be recommended. A similar book in German, of a more extended character, is Lieblingmine und Freudesliebe in der Weltliteratur, edited by Elisa von Kupfer. Mention may also be made of the Freundschaft, 1912, of Baron von Gleichen Großwurm, a sort of literary history of friendship, without specific reference to homosexuality, although many writers of inverted tendency are introduced. Platon's Tagebücher are notable as the diary of an invert of high character and ideals. The volumes of the Jahrbuch für sexuelle Schwissenstufen contain many studies bearing on the ideal and aesthetic aspects of homosexuality. Various modern poets of high ability have given expression to emotions of exalted or passionate friendship toward individuals of the same sex, whether or not such friendship can properly be termed homosexual. It is scarcely necessary to refer to In Memoriam, in which Tennyson enshrined his affection for his early friend Arthur Hallam, and developed a picture of the universe on the basis of that affection. The poems of Edward Crackcroft Lefroy are notable, and Mr. John Gambrill Nicholson has privately issued several volumes of verse, A Chapter of Southernwood, a garland of lad's love, etc., showing delicate charm combined with high technical skill. Some books, mainly or entirely written in prose, may fairly be included in the same group. Such are In the Key of Blue, by John Eddington Simmons, and The Memoirs of Arthur Hamilton, published anonymously by a well-known author, A. C. Benson in which, on somewhat platonic lines, the idea is worked out that the individual sufferer must pass from the love of one fair form to the love of abstract beauty, and from the contemplation of his own suffering to the consideration of the root of all human suffering. As regards the modern poetic literature of feminine homosexuality, there is probably nothing to put 
beside the various volumes, pathetic in their brave simplicity and sincerity, of René Vivien, see before, page 200. Some other feminine singers of homosexuality have cautiously thrown a veil of heterosexuality over their songs. Novels of a more or less definitely homosexual tone are now very numerous in English, French, German, and other languages. In English, the homosexuality is for the most part veiled, and the narrative deals largely with school life and boys, in order that the emotional and romantic character of the relations described may appear more natural. Thus, Tim, an anonymously published book by H. O. Sturgis, 1891, describes the devotion of a boy to an older boy at Eton, and his death at an early age. Jasper Tristram, by A. W. Clarke, 1899, again, is a well-written story of a schoolboy friendship of homosexual tone. A boy is represented as feeling attraction to boys who are like girls, and a girl became attractive to the hero because she is like a boy, and recalls her brother, whom he had formerly loved. The Garden God, A Tale of Two Boys, by Forrest Reed, 1905, is another rather similar book, in its way a charming and delicately written idyll. Imre, A Memorandum, 1906, by Xavier Main, the pseudonym of an American author who has also written The Intersexes, privately issued at Naples, is a book of a different class, representing the frankly homosexual passion of two mutually attracted men, an Englishman who is supposed to write the story, and a Hungarian officer. It embodies a notable narrative of homosexual development, which is probably more or less real. In French there are a number of novels dealing with homosexuality, sometimes sympathetically, sometimes with artistic indifference, sometimes satirically. André Guide, in Le Moraliste and other books, Rachilde, Madame Vallette, Willy, in the well-known Claudine series, may be mentioned, among other writers of more or less distinction, who have once or oftener dealt with homosexuality. Special reference should be made to the Belgian author Georg Eekhout, whose Escale Vigueur, prosecuted at Bruges on its publication, is a book of special power. The homosexual stories of Esbach, of which L'Elu, 1902, is considered the best, are of a romantic and sentimental character. Lucien, 1910, by Binet Valmer, is a penetrating and scarcely sympathetic study of inversion. Nortal's Les Adolescents Passionnés, already mentioned on page 325, is a notably intimate and precise study of homosexuality in French schools. It would be easy to mention many others. In Germany, during recent years, many novels of homosexual character have been published. They are not usually, it would seem, of high literary character, but are sometimes notable as being more or less disguised narratives of real fact. Baudis, Aus eines Mannes Mädchenjahren, is said to be a faithful autobiography. Der Neue Werther, eine hellenische Passionsgeschichte, by Narcissus, 1902, is also said to be authentic. Another book that may be mentioned is Konradin's Ein junger Platos, Aus dem Leben eines Endbeistes, 1914. The German belletristic literature of homosexuality, as well as that of other countries, will be found adequately summarized and criticized by Numa Praetorius in the volumes of the Jahrbuch für sexuelle Schissenstufen. See also Hirschfeld's Die Homosexualität, pages 47 and 1018 and further. It is by some such method of self-treatment as this that most of the more highly intelligent men and women whose histories I have already briefly recorded have at last slowly and instinctively reached a condition of relative health and peace, both physical and moral. The method of self-restraint and self-culture, without self-repression, seems to be the most rational method of dealing with sexual inversion, when that condition is really organic and deeply rooted. It is better that a man should be enabled to make the best of his own strong natural instincts with all their disadvantages, than that he should be unsexed and perverted, crushed into a position which he has no natural aptitude to occupy. As both Rafalovich and Ferré have insisted, it is the ideal of chastity, rather than of normal sexuality, which the congenital invert should hold before his eyes. 
he may not have in him the making of l'homme moyen sensuel he may have in him the making of a saint what good work in the world the inverted may do is shown by the historical examples of distinguished inverts and while it is certainly true that these considerations apply chiefly to the finer grained natures the histories i have brought together suffice to show that such natures constitute a considerable proportion of inverts the helplessly gross sexual appetite cannot thus be influenced but that remains true whether the appetite is homosexual or heterosexual and nothing is gained by enabling it to feed on women as well as on men a strictly ascetic life it need scarcely be said is with difficulty possible for all persons either homosexual or heterosexual it is however outside the province of the physician to recommend his inverted patients to live according to their homosexual impulses even when those impulses seem to be natural to the person displaying them the most that the physician is entitled to do it seems to me is to present the situation clearly and leave to the patient a decision for which he must himself accept the responsibility forel goes so far as to say that he sees no reason why inverts should not build cities of their own and marry each other if they so please since they can do no harm to normal adults while children can be protected from them such notions are however too far removed from our existing social conventions to be worth serious consideration the standpoint here taken up it may be remarked by no means denies to the invert a right to the fulfilment of his impulses numa pretorius remarks it would seem justly that while the invert must properly be warned against unnatural sexual license and while those who are capable of continence do well to preserve it to deny all right to sexual activity to the invert merely causes those inverts who are incapable of self-control to throw recklessly aside all restraints Zeitschrift für sexuelle Schissenstufen, Volume 8, 1906, page 726. The invert has the right to sexual indulgence, it may be, but he has also the duty to accept the full responsibility for his own actions, and the necessity to recognize the present attitude of the society he lives in. He cannot be advised to set himself in violent opposition to that society. The world will not be a tolerable place for pronounced inverts until they are better understood, and that will involve a radical change in general and even medical opinion. An inverted physician, of high character and successful in his profession, writes to me on this point, quote, The first and easiest thing to do, it seems to me, is to convince the medical profession that we unfortunate people are not only as sane, but as moral as our normal brothers and that we are even more alive to the supreme necessity of self-control, necessary from every point of view, than they. It is not license we want, but justice. It is the cruelty and prejudice of convention which we wish to abolish, not the proper and just indignation of society with crimes against the social order. We want to make it possible for us to satisfy our inborn instincts, which are not concerned essentially with sexual acts, so-called, alone, without thereby becoming criminals. One of us, who would, under any circumstances, seduce a person of his own sex of immature age, and particularly one whose sexual complexion was unknown, deserves the severe punishment which would be meted out to a normal person who did the same to a young girl, but no more. While, so long as no public offence is given, there should be no penalty or obloquy, whatever, attached to sexual acts committed with full consent between mature persons these acts may or may not be wrong and immoral just as sexual acts between mature persons of different sexes may or may not be wrong or immoral but in neither case has the law any concern and public opinion should make no distinction between the two it is in the highest degree important that it should be clearly understood that we want no relaxation of moral obligations at present we suffer an inconceivably cruel wrong. End quote. We have always to remember, and there is indeed no possibility of forgetting, that the question of homosexuality is a social question. Within certain limits, the gratification of the normal sexual impulse, even outside marriage, arouses no general or profound indignation, and is regarded as a private matter. Rightly or wrongly, the gratification of the homosexual impulse is regarded as a public matter. This attitude is more or less exactly reflected in the law. 
thus it happens that whenever a man is openly detected in a homosexual act however exemplary his life may previously have been however admirable it may still be in all other relations every ordinary normal citizen however licentious and pleasure-loving his own life may be feels it a moral duty to regard the offender as hopelessly damned and to help in hounding him out of society at very brief intervals cases occur and without reaching the newspapers are more or less widely known in which distinguished men in various fields not seldom clergymen suddenly disappear from the country or commit suicide in consequence of some such exposure or the threat of it it is probable that many obscure tragedies could find their explanation in a homosexual cause some of the various tragic ways in which homosexual passions are revealed to society may be illustrated by the following communication from a correspondent not himself inverted who here narrates cases that came under his observation in various parts of the united states the cases referred to will be known to many but i've disguised the names of persons and places Quote, at the age of fourteen i was a chorister at blank church whose choirmaster an englishman named m w m was an accomplished man seemingly a perfect gentleman and a devout churchman he never seemed to care for the society of ladies never mingled much with the men but sought companionship with the choristers of my age he frequently visited at the homes of his favourites to tea and when he asked the parents consent for george's or frank's company on an excursion or to the theatre and then to spend the night with him such request was invariably granted i shall ever remember my first night with him he began by fondling and caressing me quieting my alarm by assurances of not hurting me and after invoking me to secrecy and with promises of many future pleasures i consented to his desire or passion which he seemed to satisfy by an attempt at fellatio was this depravity i would say no after reading his subsequent confession found in his room after his death by suicide this was brought about by his two intimate relations with the rector's son who contracted st vitus's dance and in the delirium of a fever that followed from nervous exhaustion told of him and his doings a thorough investigation took place and m fled a broken-hearted and disgraced man who as the result of remorse relentless persecution and exposure through several years ended his life by drowning himself in his confession he spoke of having been raised under a very strong moral restraint and having lived an exemplary life with the exception of this strange desire that his willpower could not control the next case is that of c h he came of an old family of brainy men who have and do yet occupy prominent places in the pulpit and the bar and was himself a gifted young attorney i knew him intimately as for six years he was a close neighbour and we were associated in lodge work he was an effeminate little fellow height five feet two inches weighed one hundred and five pounds very near-sighted and he had a light voice not a treble or falsetto but still a voice that detracted materially from the beautiful rhetoric that flowed from his lips he had served his country as its representative in the legislature and had received the nomination for senator over a hard-fought political battle the last canvas and speeches were made at a town which was in consequence crowded that night h had to occupy a room with a stranger named e a travelling salesman there were two beds in this room mr e on the following day told several people that during the night he was awakened by h who had come over to his bed and had his mouth on his person and that he had threatened to kick him out of the room but that h pleaded with him and fell on his knees and swore that he had been overcome by a passion that he had heretofore controlled and begged of him not to expose him these facts coming to the notice of his opponents within twenty-four hours they hastened to take advantage of it by placarding h as a second oscar wilde and stating the facts as far as decency and the law allowed h's friends came to him and gave him one of two alternatives if guilty either to kill himself or leave that section for ever if not guilty to slay his traducer e h affirmed his innocence and in company with two friends c and j took the train for blank learning there that e was at a town twelve miles east they hired a vast livery and drove overland 
they found E at the station, awaiting the arrival of a train. H, with a pistol, strode forward, and in his excitement said, "'You exposed me, did you?' Being near-sighted, his aim proved wide of the mark. E sprang forward and grappled with H for possession of the pistol, and was fired upon by C and J, who shot him in the back. He expired in a few minutes, his last statement being to the effect that H was guilty as accused. H, C, and J were sentenced to the penitentiary for life. During my six years' acquaintance with H, I knew of nothing derogatory to his character, nor has anyone ever come forward to say that on any other occasion he ever displayed this weakness. I know his early life had a pure atmosphere, as he was an only child and the idol of both his parents, who built high their hopes of his future success and who survived this disgrace, but are broken-hearted. End of chapter 7, part 2《Chapter Seven of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kirk Ziegler.《Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume Two by Havelock Ellis. Chapter Seven Conclusions, Part Three. The next case is that of the Reverend T. W. Professor at the University of... Mr. W. is a scholarly gentleman, affable in his address, eloquent in his oratory, and a fine classical scholar. He was exposed by some of his students, who, to use a slang phrase, accused him of being a head worker. At his examination by the faculty, he confessed his weakness and said he could not control his unholy passion. His resignation was accepted by both the church and the college, and he left. I know of a few other cases that have their peculiar traits, and am confident that these persons did not become possessed of this habit through the so-called indiscretions of youth, as in every case their early life was freer from contamination than that of ninety percent of the boys who, on reaching man's estate, have, like myself, no desire to deviate from the old-fashioned way formulated by our ancient sire Adam. It can scarcely be said that the consciousness of this attitude of society is favorable to the invert's attainment of a fairly sane and well-balanced state of mind. This is, indeed, one of the great difficulties in his way, and often causes him to waver between extremes of melancholia and egotistic exaltation. We regard all homosexuality with absolute and unmitigated disgust. We have been taught to venerate Alexander the Great, Epaminondas, Socrates, and other antique heroes, but they are safely buried in the remote past and do not affect our scorn of homosexuality in the present. It was in the fourth century at Rome that the strong modern opposition to homosexuality was first clearly formulated in law. The Roman race had long been decaying, sexual perversions of all kinds flourished, the population was dwindling. At the same time, Christianity, with its Judaic Pauline antagonism to homosexuality, was rapidly spreading. The statesmen of the day, anxious to quicken the failing pulses of national life, utilized this powerful Christian feeling. Constantine, Theodosius and Valentinian all passed laws against homosexuality, the last, at all events, ordaining as penalty the vindicious flamme. But their enactments do not seem to have been strictly carried out. In the year 538, Justinian, professing terror of certain famines, earthquakes, and pestilences, in which he saw the mysterious recompense which was meet, prophesied by St. Paul, issued his edict condemning unnatural offenders to the sword, lest as the result of these impious acts, as the preamble to his novella 77 has it, whole cities should perish together with their inhabitants, for we are taught by Holy Scripture that through these acts cities have perished with the men in them. This edict, which Justinian followed up by a fresh ordinance to the same effect, constituted the foundation of legal enactment and social opinion concerning the matter in Europe for 1,300 years. In France, the Vindices Flamme, 
survived to the last. St. Louis had handed over these sacrilegious offenders to the church to be burned. In 1750, two pederasts were burned in the Palace de Greve, and only a few years before the revolution, a Capuchin monk named Pascal was also burned. After the revolution, however, began a new movement, which has continued slowly and steadily ever since, though it still divides European nations into two groups. Justinian, Charlemagne, and St. Louis had insisted on the sin and sacrilege of sodomy as the ground for its punishment. It was doubtless largely as a religious offense that the Code Napoleon omitted to punish it. The French law makes a clear and logical distinction between crime on the one hand, vice and irreligion on the other, only concerning itself with the former. Homosexual practice in private between two consenting adult parties, whether men or women, are absolutely unpunished by the Code Napoleon and by French law of today. Only under three conditions does the homosexual act come under the cognizance of the law as a crime. One, when there is outrage public à la pédère, for example, when the act is performed in public or with a possibility of witnesses. Two, when there is violence or absence of consent, in whatever degree the act may have been consummated. 3. When one of the parties is under age or unable to give valid consent, in some cases it appears possible to apply Article 334 of the Penal Code, directed against habitual excitation to debauch of young persons of either sex under the age of 21. This method of dealing with unnatural offenses has spread widely, at first because of the political influence of France, and more recently because such an attitude has commended itself on its merits. In Belgium, the law is similar to that of the Code Napoleon, as it is also in Italy, Spain, Portugal, Romania, Japan, and numerous South American lands. In Switzerland, the law is a little vague and very slightly in the different cantons, but it is not severe. In Geneva and some other cantons there is no penalty. The general tendency is to inflict brief imprisonment when serious complaints have been lodged, and cases can sometimes be settled privately by the magistrate. The only large European countries in which homosexuality per se remains a penal offense appear to be Germany, Austria, Russia, and England. In several of the German states, such as Bavaria and Hanover, Simple homosexuality formally went unpunished, but when the laws of Prussia were in 1871 applied to the new German Empire, this ceased to be the case, and unnatural carnality between males became an offense against the law. This article of the German Code, section 175, has caused great discussion and much practical difficulty because although the terms of the law make it necessary to understand by Wiedermacherlich Unzucht other practices besides pedicatio, not every homosexual practice is included. It must be some practice resembling normal coitus. There is a widespread opinion that this article of the code should be abolished. It appears that at one time an authoritative committee pronounced in favor of this step, and their proposition came near adoption. The Austrian law is somewhat similar to the German, but it applies to women as well as to men. This is logical, for there is no reason why homosexuality should be punished in men and left unpunished in women. In Russia, the law against homosexual practices appears to be very severe, involving in some cases banishment to Siberia and deprivation of civil rights, but it can scarcely be rigorously executed. The existing law in England is severe but simple. Carnal knowledge of perenum, of either man or a woman or an animal, is punishable by a sentence of penal servitude with not less than three years or of imprisonment with not more than two years. Even gross indecency between males, however, privately committed, has been since 1885 a penal offense. The clause is open to criticism. With the omission of the words or private, it would be sound and in harmony with the most enlightened European legislation, but it must be pointed out that an act only becomes indecent when those who perform it or witness it regard it as indecent. 
The act which has brought each of us into the world is not indecent. It would become so if carried on in public. If two male persons, who have reached years of discretion, consent together to perform some act of sexual intimacy in private, no indecency has been committed. If one of the consenting parties subsequently proclaims the act, indecency may doubtless be created, as may happen also in the case of normal sexual intercourse. But it seems contrary to good policy that such proclamation should convert the act itself into a penal offense. Moreover, gross indecency between males usually means some form of mutual masturbation. No penal code regards masturbation as an offense, and there seems to be no sufficient reason why mutual masturbation should be so regarded. The main point to be ensured is that no boy or girl who has not reached years of discretion should be seduced or abused by an older person, and this point is equally well guaranteed on the basis introduced by the Code Napoleon. However shameful, disgusting, personally immoral, and indirectly antisocial it may be for two adult persons of the same sex, men or women, to consent together to perform an act of sexual intimacy in private, there is no sound or adequate ground for constituting such an act a penal offense by law. One of the most serious objections to the legal recognition of private gross indecency is the obvious fact that only in the rarest cases can such indecency become known to the police, and we thus perpetuate what is very much a legal farce. The breaking of a few laws, as Mole truly observes regarding the German law, so often goes unpunished as this. It is the same in England, as is amply evidenced by the fact that, of the English sexual inverts, whose histories I have obtained, not one, so far as I am aware, has ever appeared in a police court on this charge. It may further be pointed out that legislation against homosexuality has no clear effect either in diminishing or increasing its prevalence. This must necessarily be so as regards to the kernel of the homosexual group, if we are to regard a considerable proportion of cases as congenital. In France, homosexuality per se has been untouched by the law for a century, yet it abounds, chiefly it seems, among the lowest of the community. Although the law is silent, social feeling is strong, and when, as has been the case in one instance, a man of undoubted genius has his name associated with this perversion. It becomes difficult or impossible for the admirers of his work to associate with him personally. Very few cases of homosexuality have been recorded in France among the more intelligent classes. The literature of homosexuality is there little more than the literature of male prostitution, as described by police officials, and as carried on largely for the benefit of foreigners. In Germany and Austria, where the law against homosexuality is severe, it abounds also, perhaps to a much greater extent than in France. It certainly asserts itself more vigorously. A far greater number of cases have been recorded than in any other country, and the German literature of homosexuality is very extensive, often issued in popular form, and sometimes enthusiastically eulogistic. In England the law is exceptionally severe, yet, according to the evidence of those who have an international acquaintance with these matters, homosexuality is fully as prevalent as on the continent. Some would say that it is more so. Much the same is true of the United States, though there is less to be seen on the surface. It cannot, therefore, be said that legislative enactments have very much influence on the prevalence of homosexuality. The chief effect seems to be that the attempt at suppression arouses the finer minds among sexual inverts to undertake the enthusiastic defense of homosexuality while coarser minds are stimulated to cynical bravado. As regards the prevalence of homosexuality in the United States, I may quote from a well-informed American correspondent. The great prevalence of sexual inversion in America cities is shown by the wide knowledge of its existence. Ninety-nine normal men out of a hundred have been accosted on the streets by inverts, or have among their acquaintances men whom they know to be sexually inverted 
Everyone has seen inverts and knows what they are. The public attitude toward them is generally a negative one, indifference, amusement, contempt. The world of sexual inverts is indeed a large one in any American city, and it is a community distinctly organized, words, customs, traditions of its own, and every city has its numerous meeting places, certain churches where inverts congregate, certain cafes well known for the inverted character of their patrons, certain streets where at night every fifth man is an invert. The inverts have their own clubs with nightly meetings. These clubs are really dance halls attached to saloons and presided over by the proprietor of the saloon, himself almost invariably an invert, as are all the waiters and musicians. The frequenters of these places are male sexual inverts, usually ranging from 17 to 30 years of age. Sightseers find no difficulty in gaining entrance. Truly, they are welcomed for the drinks they buy for the company and other reasons. Singing and dancing turns by certain favorite performers are the features of these gatherings, with much gossip and drinking at the small tables ranged along the four walls of the room. The abitwe of these places are, generally, inverts of the most profound type. For example, the completely feminine in voice and manners, with the characteristic hip motion in their walk. Though I have never seen any approach to feminine dress there, doubtless the desire for it is not wanting, and only police regulations relegate it to other occasions and places. You will rightly infer that the police know of these places and endure their existence for a consideration. It is not unusual for the inquiring stranger to be directed there by a policeman. The Oscar Wilde trial, see Ante, page 48, with its wide publicity and the fundamental nature of the questions it suggested, appears to have generally contributed to give definiteness and self-consciousness to the manifestations of homosexuality and to have aroused inverts to take up a definite attitude. I have been assured in several quarters that this is so, and that since that case the manifestations of homosexuality have become more pronounced. One correspondent writes, Up to the time of the Oscar Wilde trial, I had not known what condition the law was. The moral question in itself, its relation to my own life and that of my friends, I reckoned I had solved. But now I had to ask myself how far I was justified in not only breaking the law, but in being the cause of a like breach in others, and others younger than myself. I have never allowed the dictum of the law to interfere with what I deem to be a moral development in any youth for whom I am responsible. I cannot say that the trial made me alter my course in life, of the rightness of which I was too convincingly persuaded, but it made me much more careful and it probably sharpened my sense of responsibility for the young. Reviewing the results of the trial as a whole, it doubtless did incalculable harm, and it intensified our national vice of hypocrisy. But I think it also may have done some good in that it made those who, like myself, have thought and experienced deeply in the matter, and these must be no small few, ready to strike a blow when the time comes, for what we deem right, honorable, and clean. From America a lady writes with reference to the moral position of inverts, though without allusion to the wild trial. Inverts should have the courage and independence to be themselves and to demand an investigation. If one strives to live honorably and considers the greatest good to the greatest number, it is not a crime nor a disgrace to be an invert. I do not need the law to defend me, neither do I desire to have any concessions made for me nor do I ask my friends to sacrifice their ideals for me. I, too, have ideals which I shall always hold. All that I desire, and I claim it as my right, is the freedom to exercise this divine gift of loving, which is not a menace to society nor a disgrace to me. Let it once be understood that the average invert is not a moral degenerate nor a mental degenerate, but simply a man or a woman who is less highly specialized, less completely differentiated than other men and women, and I believe the prejudice against them will disappear, and if they live uprightly, they will surely win the esteem and consideration of all thoughtful people. I know what it means to be an invert, who feels himself set apart from the rest of mankind, 
to find one human heart who trusts him and understands him, and I know how almost impossible this is, and will be, until the world is made aware of these facts. But while the law has had no more influence in repressing abnormal sexuality than, wherever it has tried to do so, it has had in repressing the normal sexual instinct, it has served to foster another offense, what is called blackmailing in England, chotas in France, erpressum in Germany, in other words, the extortion of money by threats of exposing some real or fictitious offense finds its chief field of activity in connection with homosexuality. No doubt the removal of the penalty against simple homosexuality does not abolish blackmailing, as the existence of this kind of chotas in France shows, but it renders its success less probable. On all these grounds and taking into consideration the fact that the tendency of modern legislation generally and the consensus of authoritative opinion in all countries are in this direction, it seems reasonable to conclude that neither sodomy, for example, emissio membri in anum hominis vel mulieris, or gross indecency ought to be penal offenses except under certain special circumstances. That is to say, that if two persons of either or both sexes, having reached years of discretion, privately consent to practice some perverted mode of sexual relationship, the law cannot be called upon to interfere. It should be the function of the law in this matter to prevent violence, to protect the young, and to preserve public order and decency. Whatever laws are laid down beyond this must be left to the individuals themselves, to the moralists, and to social opinion. At the same time, and while such a modification in the law seems to be reasonable, the change effected would be less considerable than may appear at first sight. In a very large proportion, indeed, of cases boys are involved. It is instructive to observe that in Leglutic's 246 cases, including victims and aggressors together, in France, 127, or more than half, were between the ages of 10 and 20 and 82, or exactly one-third were between the ages of 10 and 14. A very considerable field of operation is thus still left for the law, whatever proportion of cases may meet with no other penalty than social opinion. That, however, social opinion, law or no law, will speak with no uncertain voice is very evident. Once homosexuality was primarily a question of population or of religion, now we hear little either of its economic aspects or of its sacrilegiousness. It is for us primarily a disgusting abomination, such as a matter of taste, of aesthetics, and while unspeakably ugly to the majority, it is proclaimed as beautiful by a small minority. I do not know that we need to find fault with this aesthetic method of judging homosexuality, but it scarcely lends itself to legal purposes. To indulge in violent denunciation of the disgusting nature of homosexuality, and to measure the sentence by the disgust aroused, or to regret as one English judge is reported to have regretted when giving sentence, that gross indecency is not punishable by death is to import utterly foreign considerations into the matter. The judges who yield to this temptation would certainly never allow themselves to be consciously influenced on the bench by their political opinions. Yet aesthetic opinions are quite as foreign to law as political opinions. An act does not become criminal because it is disgusting. To eat excrement, as Mull remarks, is extremely disgusting, but it is not criminal. The confusion thus exists, even in the legal mind, between the disgusting and the criminal is additional evidence of the undesirability of the legal penalty for simple homosexuality. At the same time, it shows that social opinion is amply adequate to deal with the manifestations of inverted sexuality. So much for the legal aspects of sexual inversion. But while there can be no doubt about the amply adequate character of the existing social reaction to all manifestations of perverted sexuality, 
the question still remains how far not merely the law but also the state of public opinion should be modified in the light of such a psychological study as we have here undertaken it is clear that this public opinion molded chiefly or entirely with reference to gross vice tends to be unduly violent in its reaction what then is the reasonable attitude of society toward the congenital sexual invert it seems to lie in the avoidance of two extremes on the one hand it cannot be expected to tolerate the invert who flouts his perversion in its face and assumes that because he would rather take his pleasure with a soldier or a policeman than with their sisters he is of finer clay than the vulgar herd on the other it might well refrain from crushing with undiscerning ignorance beneath the burden of shame the subject of an abnormality which as we have seen has not been found incapable of fine uses inversion is an aberration from the usual course of nature but the clash of contending elements which must often mark the history of such a deviation results now and again by no means infrequently in nobler activities than those yielded by the vast majority who are born to consume the fruits of the earth it bears for the most part its penalty in the structure of its own organism we are bound to protect the helpless members of society against the invert if we go farther and seek to destroy the invert himself before he has sinned against society we exceed the warrant of reason and in doing so we may perhaps destroy also those children of the spirit which possess sometimes a greater worth than the children of the flesh here we may leave this question of sexual inversion in dealing with it i have sought to avoid that attitude of moral superiority which is so common in the literature of this subject and have refrained from pointing out how loathsome this phenomenon is or how hideous that such an attitude is as much out of place in scientific investigation as it is in judicial investigation and may well be left to the amateur the physician who feels nothing but disgust at the sight of disease is unlikely to bring either succor to his patients or instruction to his pupils that the investigation we have here pursued is not only profitable to us in succoring the social organism and its members but also in bringing light to the region of sexual psychology is now i hope clear to every reader who has followed me to this point there are a multitude of social questions which we cannot face squarely and honestly unless we possess such precise knowledge as has been here brought together concerning the part played by the homosexual tendency in human life moreover the study of this perverted tendency stretches beyond itself or that art which you say adds to nature is an art that nature makes pathology is but physiology working under new conditions the stream of nature still flows into the bent channel of sexual inversion and still runs according to law we have not wasted our time in this toilsome excursion with the knowledge here gained we are better equipped to enter upon the study of the wider questions of sex end of chapter seven Recording by Kirk Ziegler, Ogden, Utah. Voiceovers by Kirk dot com. Appendix A of Studies in the Psychology of Sex. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox dot org. Recording by Tom Geller. Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2, by Havelock Ellis. Appendix A, Homosexuality Among Tramps, by Josiah Flint. I have made a rather minute study of the tramp class in the United States, England, and Germany, but I know it best in the States. I have lived with the tramps there for eight consecutive months, besides passing numerous shorter periods in their company, and my acquaintance with them is nearly of ten years' standing my purpose in going among them has been to learn about their life in particular and outcast life in general this can only be done by becoming part and parcel of its manifestations there are two kinds of tramps in the united states out of works and quote, hobos unquote. the out of works are not genuine vagabonds they really want work and have no sympathy with the hobos 
The latter are the real tramps. They make a business of begging, a very good business too, and keep at it as a rule to the end of their days. Whiskey and Wanderlust, or the love of wandering, are probably the main causes of their existence. But many of them are discouraged criminals, men who have tried their hand at crime and find that they lack criminal wit. They become tramps because they find that life, quote, on the road, end quote, comes the nearest to the life they hoped to lead. They have enough talent to do very well as beggars, better, generally speaking, than the men who have reached the road simply as drunkards. They know more about the tricks of the trade and are cleverer in thinking out schemes and stories. All genuine tramps in America are, however, pretty much the same as far as manners and philosophy are concerned, and all are equally welcome at the, quote, hangout, end quote. The class of society from which they are drawn is generally the very lowest of all, but there are some hobos who have come from the very highest, and these latter are frequently as vicious and depraved as their less well-born brethren. Concerning sexual inversion among tramps, there is a great deal to be said, and I cannot attempt to tell all I have heard about it, but merely to give a general account of the matter. Every hobo in the United States knows what, quote, unnatural intercourse, end quote, means, talking about it freely, and according to my finding, every tenth man practices it and defends his conduct. Boys are the victims of this passion. The tramps gain possession of these boys in various ways. A common method is to stop for a while in some town and gain acquaintance with the slum children. They tell these children all sorts of stories about life, quote, on the road, end quote. How they can ride on the railways for nothing, shoot Indians, and be professionals, professionals. And they choose some boy who specially pleases them. By smiles and flattering caresses, they let him know that the stories are meant for him alone. And before long, if the boy is a suitable subject, he smiles back just as slyly. In time he learns to think that he is the favorite of the tramp, who will take him on his travels, and he begins to plan secret meetings with the man. The tramp, of course, continues to excite his imagination with stories and caresses, and some fine night there is one boy less in the town. On the road the lad is called a, quote, Prussian, and his protector a, quote, jocker, end quote. The majority of Prussians are between 10 and 15 years of age, but I have known some under 10 and a few over 15. Each is compelled by hobo law to let his jocker do with him as he will, and many, I fear, learn to enjoy his treatment of them. They are also expected to beg in every town they come to, any laziness on their part receiving very severe punishment. How the act of unnatural intercourse takes place is not entirely clear. The hobos are not agreed. From what I have personally observed, I should say that it is usually what they call legwork, intercrural, but sometimes emissio penis in anum, the boy in either case lying on his stomach. I have heard terrible stories of the physical results to the boy of anal intercourse. One evening, near Cumberland, Pennsylvania, I was an unwilling witness to one of the worst scenes that can be imagined. In company with eight hobos, I was in a freight car attached to a slowly moving train. A colored boy succeeded in scrambling into the car, and when the train was well under way again, he was tripped up and seduced, to use the hobo euphemism, by each of the tramps. He made almost no resistance and joked and laughed about the business as if he had expected it. This, indeed, I find to be the general feeling among the boys when they have been thoroughly initiated. At first they do not submit and are inclined to run away or fight, but the men fondle and pet them, and after a while they do not seem to care. Some of them have told me that they get as much pleasure out of the affair as the jocker does. Even little fellows under ten have told me this, and I have known them to willfully tempt their jockers to intercourse. What the pleasure consists in, I cannot say. The youngsters themselves describe it as a delightful tickling sensation in the parts involved, and this is possibly all that it amounts to among the smallest lads. Those who have passed the age of puberty seem to be satisfied in pretty much the same way that the men are. Among the men, the practice is decidedly one of passion. The majority of them prefer a Prussian to a woman, and nothing is more severely judged than rape. 
One often reads in the newspapers that a woman has been assaulted by a tramp, but the perverted tramp is never the guilty party. I believe, however, that there are a few hobos who have taken to boys because women are so scarce, quote, on the road, end quote. For every woman in Hoboland, there are a hundred men. That this disproportion has something to do with the popularity of boys is made clear by the following case. In a jail, where I was confined for a month during my life in vagabondage, I got acquainted with a tramp who had the reputation of being a, quote, sod, end quote, sodomist. One day a woman came to the jail to see her husband, who was awaiting trial. One of the prisoners said he had known her before she was married and had lived with her. The tramp was soon to be discharged, and he inquired where the woman lived. On learning that she was still approachable, he looked her up immediately after his release and succeeded in staying with her for nearly a month. He told me later that he enjoyed his life with her much more than his intercourse with boys. I asked him why he went with boys at all, and he replied, "'Cause there ain't women enough. If I can't get them, I got to have the other.'" It is in jails that one sees the worst side of this perversion. In the daytime, the prisoners are let out into a long hall and can do much as they please. At night, they are shut up, two and even four in a cell. If there are any boys in the crowd, they are made use of by all who care to have them. If they refuse to submit, they are gagged and held down. The sheriff seldom knows what goes on, and for the boys to say anything to him would be suicidal. There is a criminal ignorance all over the states concerning the life of these jails, and things go on that would be impossible in any well-regulated prison. In one of these places I once witnessed the fiercest fight I have ever seen among hobos. A boy was the cause of it. Two men said they loved him, and he seemed to return the affection of both with equal desire. A fight with razors was suggested to settle who should have him. The men prepared for action while the crowd gathered round to watch. They slashed away for over half an hour, cutting each other terribly, and then their backers stopped them for fear of fatal results. The boy was given to the one who was hurt the least. Jealousy is one of the first things one notices in connection with this passion. I have known them to withdraw entirely from the, quote, hangout, end quote, life, simply to be sure that their Prussians were not touched by other tramps. Such attachments frequently last for years, and some boys remain with their first jockers until they are, quote, emancipated, end quote. Emancipation means freedom to snare some other boy and make him submit as the other had been obliged to submit when younger. As a rule, the Prussian is freed when he is able to protect himself. If he can defend his honor from all who come, he is accepted into the class of, quote, old stagers, end quote, and may do as he likes. This is the one reward held out to Prussians during their apprenticeship. They are told that some day they can have a boy and use him as they have been used. Thus Hoboland is always sure of recruits. It is difficult to say how many tramps are sexually inverted. It is not even certainly known how many vagabonds there are in the country. I have stated in one of my papers on tramps that, counting the boys, there are between 50 and 60,000 genuine hobos in the United States. A vagabond in Texas who saw this statement wrote me that he considered my estimate too low. The newspapers have criticized it as too high, but they are unable to judge. If my figures are, as I believe, at least approximately correct, the sexually perverted tramps may be estimated at between five and six thousand. This includes men and boys. I have been told lately by tramps that the boys are less numerous than they were a few years ago. They say that it is now a risky business to be seen with a boy and that it is more profitable, as far as begging is concerned, to go without them. Whether this means that the passion is less fierce than it used to be, or that the men find sexual satisfaction among themselves, I cannot say definitely. But from what I know of their disinclination to adopt the latter alternative, I am inclined to think that the passion may be dying out somewhat. I am sure that women are not more numerous, quote, on the road, end quote, than formerly, and that the change, if real, has not been caused by them. So much for my finding in the United States. In England, where I have also lived with tramps for some time, I have found very little contrary sexual feeling. In Germany, also, excepting in prisons and workhouses, it seems very little known among vagabonds. 
There are a few Jewish wanderers, sometimes peddlers, who are said to have boys in their company, and I am told that they use them as the hoboes in the United States use their boys, but I cannot prove this from personal observation. In England I have met a number of male tramps who had no hesitation in declaring their preference for their own sex, and particularly for boys, but I am bound to say that I have seldom seen them with boys. As a rule they were quite alone, and they seemed to live chiefly by themselves. It is a noteworthy fact that both in England and Germany there are a great many women, quote, on the road, end quote, or, at all events, so near it that intercourse with them is easy and cheap. In Germany, almost every town has its quarter of Stottschietze, women who sell their bodies for a very small sum. They seldom ask over thirty or forty pfennigs for a night, which is usually spent in the open air. In England it is practically the same thing. In all the large cities there are women who are glad to do business for three or four pence, and those, quote, on the road, end quote, for even less. The general impression made on me by the sexually perverted men I have met in vagabondage is that they are abnormally masculine. In their intercourse with boys, they always take the active part. The boys have, in some cases, seemed to me uncommonly feminine, but not as a rule. In the main, they are very much like other lads, and I am unable to say whether their liking for the inverted relationship is inborn or acquired. That it is, however, a genuine liking in altogether too many instances, I do not in the least doubt. As such, and all the more because it is such, it deserves to be more thoroughly investigated and more reasonably treated. Josiah Flint, who wrote the foregoing account of tramp life for the second edition of this volume, was well known as author, sociologist, and tramp. He was especially, and it would seem by innate temperament, the tramp, which part he looked to perfection. He himself referred to his, quote, weasoned face and diminutive form, end quote, and felt completely at home in. He was thus able to throw much light on the psychology of the tramp, and his books, such as Trampling with Tramps, are valuable from this point of view. His real name was F. Willard, and he was a nephew of Miss Frances Willard. He died in Chicago in 1907 at the age of 38, shortly after writing a frank and remarkable autobiography. I am able to supplement his observations on tramps, so far as England is concerned, by the following passages from a detailed record sent to me by an English correspondent. I am a male invert with complete feminine sexual inclinations. Different meetings with tramps led me to seek intimacy with them, and for about twenty years I have gone on the tramp myself, so that I might come in the closest contact with them in England, Scotland, and Wales. As in the United States, there are two classes of tramps, those who would work, such as harvesters, road-makers, etc., and those who will not work, but make tramping a profession. Among both these classes, my experience is that 90%, or I even would be bold enough to say 100%, indulge in homosexuality when the opportunity occurs, and I do not make any distinction between the two classes. There are numerous reasons for this, and I will state a few. A certain number may prefer normal connection with a female, but except for those who tramp in vans and a limited number who have donnas with them, women are not available, as prostitutes very seldom allow intimacy for, quote, love, end quote, except when drunk. Tramps are also afraid of any venereal disease, as it means the misery of the lock hospital. Most of them are sociable and prefer to tramp with a, quote, make, end quote. With this mate, with whom he sleeps and rests and boozes when they are in funds, sexual intimacy naturally takes place, as my experience has been that one of the two is male and the other female in their sexual desires, but I have known instances where they have acted both roles. Then male prostitution is to be had for nothing, and even occasionally when a tramp meets a, quote, toff, end quote, it is a means of earning money, either fairly or otherwise. I have never known a male tramp to refuse satisfaction if I offered a drink or two, or a small sum of money. 
One told me that he envied, quote, no lords or toffs, end quote, as long as he got plenty of, quote, booze and buggery, end quote. Another one, who told me that he had been twenty-five years on the road, said that he could not endure to sleep alone. He was a peddler, openly of cheap religious books and secretly of the vilest pamphlets and photographs. He had done time, and he said the greatest punishment to him was not being able to have a make who would submit to penetration, though he was not particular what form the sexual act took. Another fine young man, whom I chanced to meet the very day he had been released from a long sentence in prison for burglary, and with whom I passed a night of incessant and almost brutal intimacy, said his punishment was seeing men always about him and being unable to have connection with them. Another and very powerful influence in tramps toward homosexuality is that, in the low lodging houses they are obliged to frequent, a single bed is perhaps double to one with a bedmate whom perhaps he has never seen before, and especially in hot weather, when the rule is nakedness. My sexual desires being for the male invert, I have come most in contact with them and have found that they form much the larger class. Among harvesters and seafaring tramps, it is seldom you find a, quote, dandy, end quote, such as I was considered, and as such I was eagerly courted, and any suggestion of intimacy on my part quickly responded to. As regards the use of young boys for homosexual indulgence, it is not common as it is too dangerous, though I have known boys, especially those belonging to vans or gypsies, to prostitute themselves, always for money. On one occasion I saw a boy who created quite an outburst of lust of homosexual nature. The incident took place in a small seafaring town in Scotland one evening before a fair was to be held. It occurred in a low public house where a number of very rough and mostly drunken men were assembled. A blind man came in, led by an extremely pretty but effeminate-looking youth of about seventeen, wearing a ragged kilt and with bare legs and feet. He had long, curling, fair hair which reached to his shoulders, and on it an old bonnet was perched. He also wore an old velveteen shooting jacket. All eyes were turned on the pair, and they were quickly offered drinks. A remark was made by one man that he believed the youth was a lassie. The boy said, I will show you I am a laddie, and pulled up his kilt, exposing his genitals and then his posterior. Boisterous laughter greeted this indecent exposure and suggestion, and more drinks were provided. The blind man then played his fiddle, and the boy danced with frequent recurrences of the same indecencies. He was seized, kissed, and caressed by quite a number of men, some of whom endeavored to masturbate him, which he resisted, but performed it for them. After the closing time came, I and about ten or twelve men all occupied the same room. The old man continued to play, and the youth, stark naked, continued to dance and suggested we others should do so, and an erotic scene took place which was only closed to view by the boss who was present putting out the lamp. Two classes of tramps I have met openly declare their preference for homosexuality. They are men who have been in the army, and sailors and seafaring men in general. It is said that, quote, Jack has a wife in every port, end quote, but I believe from my experience that the wife, in many cases, is of the male sex, and this among those of all nationalities, as is the case with soldiers. Among these, also jealousy is more common than among ordinary tramps, and if you are dandy to a soldier, if you make advances or receive them from a senior, trouble is likely to occur between them. I could give many instances of my own personal experiences to show that tramps are looked upon by men in the country districts as legitimate, complacent, and purchasable objects for homosexual lust. End of Appendix A Recording by Tom Geller, Oberlin, Ohio, TomGeller.com, T-O-M-G-E-L-L-E-R.com. Appendix B of Studies in the Psychology of Sex. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2, by Havelock Ellis. Appendix B. The School Friendship of Girls. A school friendship is termed by Italian girls a flame, flama. This term, as explained by Obici and Marchesini, indicates, in school slang, both the beloved person and the friendship in the abstract. But it is a friendship which has the note of passion as felt and understood in this environment. In every college, the flame is regarded as a necessary institution. The friendship is usually of a markedly platonic character and generally exists between a boarder on one side and a day pupil on the other. Notwithstanding, however, its apparently non-sexual nature, all the sexual manifestations of college youth circle around it, and, in its varying aspects of differing intensity, all the gradations of sexual sentiment may be expressed. Obici and Marchesini carried on their investigation chiefly among the pupils of normal schools, the age of the girls being between twelve and nineteen or twenty. There are both boarders and day pupils at these colleges. The boarders are most inflammable, but it is the day pupils who furnish the sparks. Obici and Marchesini received much assistance in their studies from former pupils who are now themselves teachers. One of these, a day pupil who had never herself been either the object or the agent in one of those passions, but had had ample opportunity of making personal observations, writes as follows quote, the flame proceeds exactly like a love relationship it often happens that one of the girls shows manlike characteristics either in physical type or in energy and decision of character the other lets herself be loved acting with all the obstinacy and one might almost say the shyness of a girl with her lover the beginning of these relationships is quite different from the usual beginnings of friendship. It is not by being always together, talking and studying together, that two become flames. No, generally they do not even know each other. One sees the other on the stairs, in the garden, in the corridors, and the emotion that arises is nearly always called forth by beauty and physical grace. Then the one who is first struck begins a regular courtship, frequent walks in the garden when the other is likely to be at the window of her classroom, pauses on the stairs to see her pass. In short, a mute adoration made up of glances and sighs. Later come presents of beautiful flowers and little messages conveyed by complacent companions. Finally, if the flame shows signs of appreciating all these proofs of affection, comes the letter of declaration. Letters of declaration are long and ardent, to such a degree that they equal or surpass real love declarations. The courted one nearly always accepts, sometimes with enthusiasm, oftenest with many objections and doubts as to the affection declared. It is only after many entreaties that she yields and the relationship begins. Unquote. Another collaborator who has herself always aroused very numerous flames gives a very similar description together with other particulars. Thus she states, quote, It may be said that 60% of the girls in a college have flame relationships and that of the remaining 40, only half refuse from deliberate repulsion to such affections, the other two twenty are excluded either because they are not sufficiently pleasing in appearance or because their characters do not inspire sympathy. Unquote. And regarding the method of beginning the relationship, she writes, quote, Sometimes flames arise before the two future friends have even seen each other merely because one of them is considered as beautiful, sympathetic, nice, or elegant. Elegance exerts an immense fascination, especially on the boarders, who are bound down by monotonous and simple habits. As soon as the boarder hears of a day pupil that she is charming and elegant, she begins to feel a lively sympathy toward her, rapidly reaching anxiety to see her. The longed-for morning at length arrives. The beloved, unconscious of the tumult of passions she has aroused, goes into school, not knowing that her walk, her movements, her garments are being observed from stairs or dormitory corridor. 
for the boarders these events constitute an important part of college life and often assume for some the aspect of a tragedy which fortunately may be gradually resolved into a comedy or a farce Unquote. many letters are written in the course of these relationships obici and marchesini have been able to read over three hundred such letters which had been carefully preserved by the receivers and which indeed formed the chief material for their study these letters clearly show that the flame most usually arises from a physical sympathy and admiration of beauty and elegance the letters written in this flame relationship are full of passion they appear to be often written during periods of physical excitement and psychic erotism and may be considered obici and marchesini remark a form of intellectual onanism of which the writers afterward feel remorse and shame as of a physically dishonorable act in reference to the underlying connection of these feelings with the sexual impulse one of the lady collaborators writes quote, i can say that a girl who is in love with a man never experiences flame emotions for a companion unquote. Obici and Marchesini thus summarize the differential character of flames as distinguished from ordinary friendships. Quote, 1. The extraordinary frequency with which, even by means of subterfuges, the lovers exchange letters. 2. The anxiety to see and talk to each other, to press each other's hands, to embrace and kiss. 3. The long conversations and the very long reveries. 4 persistent jealousy with its manifold arts and usual results five exaltation of the beloved's qualities six the habit of writing the beloved's name everywhere seven absence of envy for the loved one's qualities eight the lover's abnegation in conquering all obstacles to the manifestations of her love nine the vanity with which some respond to flame declarations 10. The consciousness of doing a prohibited thing. 11. The pleasure of conquest, of which the trophies, letters, and so on, are preserved. Unquote. The difference between a flame and a friendship is very well marked in the absolute exclusiveness of the former, whence arises the possibility of jealousy. At the same time, friendship and love are here woven together. The letters are chaste a few exceptions among so many letters not affecting the general rule and the purity of the flame relationship is also shown by the fact that it is usually between boarders and day pupils girls in different classes in different rooms and seldom between those who are living in close proximity to each other Quote, certainly writes one of the lady collaborators the first sensual manifestations develop in girls with physical excitement pure and simple but at all events i would wish to believe it the majority of college girls find sufficient satisfaction in being as near as possible to the beloved person of whichever sex in mutual admiration and in kissing or very frequently in conversation that is by no means moral though usually very metaphorical the object of such conversation is to discover the most important mysteries of human nature the why and the wherefore it deals with natural necessities which the girl feels and has an intuition of but as yet knows nothing definite about such conversations are the order of the day in schools and in colleges and specially revolve around procreation the most difficult mystery of all they are a heap of stupidities unquote. this lady had only known of one definite homosexual relationship during the whole of her college life the couple in question were little liked and had no other flames the chief general sexual manifestations, this lady concludes, which she had noted among her companions, was a constant preoccupation with sexual mysteries and the necessity of talking about them perpetually. Another lady collaborator who had lived in a normal school had had somewhat wider experiences. She entered at the age of fourteen and experienced the usual loneliness and unhappiness of a new pupil. One day, as she was standing pensive and alone in a corner of the room, a companion, one who on her arrival had been charged to show her over the college, ran up to her, quote, embracing me, closing my mouth with a kiss, and softly caressing my hair. I gazed at her in astonishment, but experienced a delicious sensation of supreme comfort. 
Here began the idyll. I was subjected to a furious tempest of kisses and caresses, which quite stunned me and made me ask myself the reason of such a new and unforeseen affection. I ingeniously inquired the reason, and the reply was, I love you, you struck me immediately I saw you, because you are so beautiful and so white, and because it makes me happy and soothes me when I can pass my hands through your hair and kiss your plump white face. I need a soul and a body. This seemed to me the language of a superior person, for I could not grasp all its importance. As on the occasion when she first embraced me, I looked at her in astonishment and could not for the moment respond to a new fury of caresses and kisses. I felt that they were not like the kisses of my mamma, my papa, my brother, and other companions. They gave me unknown sensations. The contact of those moist and freshy lips disturbed me. Then came the exchange of letters and the usual rites and duties of flames. When we met in the presence of others, we were only to greet each other simply, for flames were strictly prohibited. I obeyed because I liked her, but also because I was afraid of their fellow-like jealousy. She would suffocate me, even bite me when I played joyously and thoughtlessly with others, and woe to me if I failed to call her when I was combing my hair. She liked to see me with my hair down, and would rest her head on my shoulder, especially if I were partially undressed. I let her do as she liked, and she would scold me severely because I was never first in longing for her, running to meet her and kissing her. But at the same time the thought of losing her, the thought that perhaps one day she would shower her caresses on others, secretly wounded my heart. But I never told her this. One day, however, when, with a headmistress gazing at a beautiful landscape, I was suddenly overwhelmed with sadness and burst out crying. The headmistress inquired what was the matter, and throwing myself in her arms I sobbed. I love her, and I shall die if she leaves off loving me. She smiled, and the smile went through my heart. I saw at once how silly I was, and what a wrong road my companion was on. From that day I could no longer endure my flame. The separation was absolute. I courageously bore bites and insults, even scratches on my face, followed by long complaints and complete prostration. I thought it would be mean to accuse her, but I invented a pretext for having the number of my bed changed. This was because she would dress quietly and come to pass hours by my bed, resting her head on the pillow. She said she wished to smell the perfume of my health and freshness. This continual turbulent desire had now nauseated me, and I wished to avoid it altogether. Later I heard that she had formed a relationship which was not blessed by any sacred rite. Unquote. Notwithstanding the platonic character of the correspondences, Obici and Marcazzini remark, there is really a substratum of emotional sexuality beneath it, and it is this which finds its expression in the indecorous conversations already referred to. The flame is a love fiction, a play of sexual love. This characteristic comes out in the frequently romantic names of men and women invented to sign the letters. Even in the letters themselves, however, the element of sexual impressionability may be traced. Quote, on Friday we went to a service at San B, writes one who was in an institution directed by nuns. But, unfortunately, I saw M. L. at a window when I thought she was at A, and I was in a nervous state the whole time. Imagine that that dear woman was at the window with bare arms and, as it seemed to me, in her chemise. Unquote. No doubt a similar impression might have been made on a girl living in her own family, but it is certain that the imaginative colouring tends to be more lively in those living in colleges and shut off from that varied and innocent observation which renders those outside colleges freer and more unprejudiced. On a boy who is free to see as many women as he chooses, a woman's face cannot make such an impression as on a boy who lives in a college and who is liable to be, as it were, electrified if he sees any object belonging to a woman, especially if he sees it by stealth or during a mood of erotism. Such an object calls out a whole series of wanton imaginations, which it could not do in one who, by his environment, was already armed against any tendencies to erotic fetishism. The attraction exerted by that which we see but seldom, and around which fancy assiduously plays, 
the attraction of forbidden fruit produces tendencies and habits which could scarcely develop in freedom curiosity is acute and is augmented by the obstacles which stand in the way of its satisfaction flame attraction is the beginning of such a morbid fetishism a sentiment which under other conditions would never have gone beyond ordinary friendship may thus become a flame and even a flame of markedly sexual character under these influences boys and girls feel the purest and simplest sentiments in a hyperesthetic manner the girls here studied have lost an exact conception of the simple manifestations of friendship and think they are giving evidence of exquisite sensibility and true friendship by loving a companion to madness friendship in them has become a passion that this intense desire to love a companion passionately is a result of the college environments may be seen by the following extract from a letter Quote, you know dear much better than i do how acutely girls living away from their own homes and far from all those who are dearest to them on earth feel the need of loving and being loved you can understand how hard it is to be obliged to live without anyone to surround you with affection Unquote and the writer goes on to say how all her love turns to her correspondent while there is an unquestionable sexual element in the flame relationship this cannot be regarded as an absolute expression of real congenital perversion of the sex instinct the frequency of the phenomena as well as the fact that on leaving college to enter social life the girl usually ceases to feel these emotions are sufficient to show the absence of congenital abnormality the estimate of the frequency of flames in normal schools given to obici and marchesini by several lady collaborators was about sixty per cent but there is no reason to suppose that women teachers furnish a larger contingent of perverted individuals than other women the root is organic but the manifestations are ideal and platonic in contrast with some other manifestations found in college life no inquiry was made as to the details of solitary sexual manifestations in the colleges the fact that they exist to more or less extent being sufficiently recognized the conversations already referred to are a measure of the excitations of sexuality existing in these college inmates and multiplied in energy by communication such discourse was wrote one collaborator the order of the day and it took place chiefly at the time when letter writing also was easiest it may well be that sensual excitations transformed into ethereal sentiments serve to increase the intensity of the flames taken altogether a which and marchesini conclude the flame may be regarded as a provisional synthesis we find here in solution together the physiological element of incipient sexuality the physical element of the tenderness natural to this age and sex the element of occasion offered by the environment and the social element with its nascent altruism that the phenomena described in minute detail by obici and marchesini closely resemble the phenomena as they exist in english girls schools is indicated by the following communication for which i am indebted to a lady who is familiar with an english girls college of very modern type Quote, from inquiries made in various quarters and through personal observation and experience i have come to the conclusion that the romantic and emotional attachments formed by girls for their female friends and companions attachments which take a great hold of their minds for the time being are far commoner than is generally supposed among english girls more especially at school or college or wherever a number of girls or young women live together in one institution and are much secluded as far as i have been able to find out these attachments which have their own local names for example raves spoons and so on are comparatively rare in the smaller private schools and totally absent among girls of the poorer class attending board in national schools perhaps because they mix more freely with the opposite sex i can say from personal experience that in one of the largest and best english colleges where i spent some years raving is especially common in spite of arrangements which one would have thought would have abolished most unhealthy feelings the arrangements there are very similar to a large boys college there are numerous boarding houses which have on an average forty to fifty students each house is under the management of a well-educated housemistress assisted by house governesses quite separate from college teachers each house has a large garden with tennis courts and so on 
and cricket hockey and other games are carried on to a large extent games being not only much encouraged but much enjoyed each girl has a separate cubicle or bedroom and no junior under seventeen years of age is allowed to enter the cubicle or bedroom of another without asking permission or to go to the bedrooms during the day in fact everything is done to discourage any morbid feelings but all the same as far as my experience goes the friendships there seem more violent and more emotional than in most places and sex subjects form one of the chief topics of conversation in such large schools and colleges these raves are not only numerous but seem to be perennial among the girls of all ages from thirteen years upward girls under that age may be fond of some other student or teacher but in quite a different way these raves are not mere friendships in the ordinary sense of the word nor are they incompatible with ordinary friendships a girl with a rave often has several intimate friends for whom affection is felt without the emotional feelings and pleasurable excitement which characterize a rave from what i have been told by those who have experienced these raves and have since been in love with men the emotions called forth in both cases were similar although in the case of the rave this fact was not recognized at the time this appears to point to a sexual basis but on the other hand there are many cases where the feeling seems to be more spiritual a sort of uplifting of the whole soul with an intense desire to lead a very good life the feeling being one of reverence more than anything else for the loved one with no desire to become too intimate and no desire for physical contact raves as a rule begin quite suddenly they may be mutual or all on one side in the case of schoolgirls the mutual rave is generally found between two companions or the girls may have a rave for one of their teachers or some grown-up acquaintance who does not necessarily enter into the school life in this case there may or may not be a feeling of affection for the girl by her rave though minus all the emotional feelings occasionally a senior student will have a rave on a little girl but these cases are rare and not very active in their symptoms girls over eighteen having fewer raves and generally condemning them in the large school already referred to of which i have personal knowledge raving was very general hardly anyone being free from it any fresh student would soon fall a victim to the fashion which rather points to the fact that it is infectious sometimes there might be a lull in the general raving only to reappear after an interval in more or less of an epidemic form sometimes nearly all the raves were felt by students for their teachers at other times it was more apparent between the girls themselves sometimes one teacher was raved on by several girls in many cases the girls raving on a teacher would have a very great friendship with one of their companions talking with each other constantly of their respective raves describing their feelings and generally letting off steam to one another indulging sometimes in the active demonstrations of affection which they were debarred from showing the teacher herself and in some cases having no desire to do so even if they could as far as i have been able to judge there is not necessarily any attraction for physical characteristics as beauty elegance and so on the two participants are probably both of strong character or a weak character raves on a stronger but rarely vice versa i have often noticed that the same person may be raved on at different times by several people of different characters and of all ages say up to thirty years of age it is hard to say why some persons more than others should inspire this feeling often they are reserved without any particular physical attraction and often despising raving and emotional friendships and give no encouragement to them that the majority of raves have a sexual basis may be true but i am sure that in the majority of cases where young girls are concerned this is not in the least recognized and no impurity is indulged in or wished for the majority of the girls are entirely ignorant of all sexual matters and understand nothing whatever about them but they do wander about them and talk about them constantly more especially when they have a rave which seems to point to some subtle connection between the two that this ignorance exists is largely to be deplored the subject if once thought of is always thought of and talked of and information is at length generally gained in a regrettable manner from personal experience i know the evil results that this ignorance and constant endeavouring to find out everything has on the mind and bodies of schoolgirls 
if children had the natural and simple laws of creation carefully explained to them by their parents much harm would be prevented and the conversation would not always turn on sexual matters the bible is often consulted for the discovery of hidden mysteries raves and teachers are far commoner than between two girls in this case the girl makes no secret of her attachment constantly talking of it and describing her feelings to any who care to listen and writing long letters to her friends about the same in the case of two girls there is more likely to be a sexual element great pleasure being taken in close contact with one another and frequent kissing and hugging when parted long letters are written often daily they are full of affectionate expressions of love and so on but there is also a frequent reference to the happiness and desire to do well that their love has inspired them with while often very deeply religious feelings appear to be generated and many good resolutions are made their various emotional feelings are described in every minute detail to each other the duration of raves varies i have known them to last three or four years more often only a few months occasionally what began as a rave will turn into a sensible firm friendship i imagine that there is seldom any actual inversion and on growing up the raves generally cease that the ravers feel and act like a pair of lovers there is no doubt and the majority put down these romantic friendships for their own sex as due in a great extent in the case of girls at schools to being without the society of the opposite sex this may be true in some cases but personally i think the question open to discussion these friendships are often found among girls who have left school and have every liberty even among girls who have had numerous flirtations with the opposite sex who cannot be accused of inversion and who have all the feminine and domestic characteristics in illustration of these points i may bring forward the following case a and b were two girls at the same college they belonged to different cliques or sets occupied different bedrooms never met in their school work and were practically only known to one another by name one day they chanced to sit next to one another at some meal they both already had raves a on an actor she had lately seen b on a married woman at her home the conversation happened to turn on raves and mutual attraction was suddenly felt from that moment a new interest came into their lives they lived for one another at the time a was fourteen b a year older both were somewhat precocious for their age were practical with plenty of common sense very keen on games interested in their lessons and very independent but at the same time with marked feminine characteristics and popular with the opposite sex after the first feeling of interest there was a subtle excitement and desire to meet again all their thoughts were occupied with the subject each day they managed as many private meetings as possible they met in the passages in order to say good-night with many embraces as far as possible they hid their feelings from the rest of the world they became inseparable and a very lasting and real but somewhat emotional affection in which the sexual element was certainly marked sprang up between them although at the time they were both quite ignorant of sexual matters yet they indulged their sexual instincts to some extent they felt surcharged with hitherto unexperienced feelings and emotions instinct urged them to let these have play but instinctively they also had a feeling that to do so would be wrong this feeling they endeavoured to argue out and find reasons for when parted for any length of time they felt very miserable and wrote pages to one another every day pouring forth in writing their feelings for one another in this time of active attraction they both became deeply religious for a time the active part of the affection continued for three or four years and now after an interval of ten years they are both exceedingly fond of one another although their paths in life are divided and each has since experienced love for a man both look back upon the sexual element in their friendship with some interest it may be remarked in passing that a and b are both attractive girls to men and women and b especially appears always to have roused rave feelings in her own sex without the slightest encouragement on her part the duration of this rave was exceptionally long the majority only lasting a few months while some girls have one rave after another or two or three together 
i may mention one other case where i believe that if it had a sexual basis this was not recognized by the parties concerned or their friends two girls over twenty years of age passed in a corridor a few words were exchanged the beginning of a very warm and fast friendship they said it was not a rave they were absolutely devoted to one another but from what i know of them and what they have since told me their feelings were quite free from any sexual desires though their love for one another was great when parted they exchanged letters daily but were always endeavouring to urge one another on in all the virtues and as far as i can gather they never gave way to any feeling they thought was not for the good of their souls letters and presents are exchanged vows of eternal love are made quarrels are engaged in for the mere pleasure of reconciliation and jealousy is easily manifested although raves are chiefly found among schoolgirls they are by no means confined to them but are common among any community of women of any age say under thirty and are not unknown among married women when there is no inversion in these cases there is usually of course no ignorance of sexual matters whether there is any direct harm in these friendships i have not been able to make up my mind in the case of schoolgirls if there is not too much emotion generated and if the sexual feelings are not indulged in i think they may do more good than harm later on in life when all one's desires and feelings are at their strongest it is more doubtful Unquote. that the phenomena as found in the girls colleges of america are exactly similar to those in italy and england is shown among other evidence by some communications sent to mr e g lancaster of clark university worcester massachusetts a few years ago mr e g lancaster sent out a questionnaire to over eight hundred teachers and older pupils dealing with various points connected with adolescence and received answers from ninety-one persons containing information which bore on the present question of this number twenty-eight male and forty-one female had been in love before the age of twenty-five while eleven of each sex had had no love experiences this indicating since the women were in a majority that the absence of love experience is more common in men than in women these answers were from young people between sixteen and twenty-five years of age two males and seven females have loved imaginary characters while three males and not less than forty-six females speak of passionate love for the same sex love of the same sex Lancaster remarks though not generally known is very common it is not mere friendship the love is strong real and passionate it may be remarked that these forty-nine cases were reported without solicitation since there was no reference to homosexual love in the questionnaire many of the answers to the syllabus are so beautiful lancaster observes that if they could be printed in full no comment would be necessary he quotes a few of the answers thus a woman of thirty-three writes Quote, at fourteen i had my first case of love but it was with a girl it was insane intense love but had the same quality and sensations as my first love with a man at eighteen in neither case was the object idealized i was perfectly aware of the faults nevertheless my whole being was lost immersed in their existence the first lasted two years the second seven years no love has since been so intense but now these persons though living are no more to me than the veriest stranger unquote. another woman of thirty-five writes quote, girls between the ages of fourteen and eighteen at college or girls schools often fall in love with the same sex this is not friendship the loved one is older more advanced more charming or beautiful when i was a freshman in college i knew at least thirty girls who were in love with a senior some sought her because it was the fashion but i knew that my own homage and that of many others was sincere and passionate i loved her because she was brilliant and utterly indifferent to the love shown her she was not pretty though at the time we thought her beautiful one of her adorers on being slighted was ill for two weeks on her return she was speaking to me when the object of our admiration came into the room the shock was too great and she fainted when i reached the senior year i was the recipient of languishing glances original verses roses and passionate letters written at midnight and three in the morning Unquote. 
no similar confessions are recorded from men in south america corresponding phenomena have been found in schools and colleges of the same class there they have been especially studied by mercante in the convent high schools of buenos aires where the students are girls between the ages of ten and twenty-two mercante found that homosexuality here is not clearly defined or explicit and usually it is combined with a predisposition to romanticism and mysticism it is usually of a passive kind but in this form so widespread as to constitute a kind of epidemic it was most manifest in institutions where the greatest stress was placed on religious instruction the recreations of the school in question were quiet and enervating active or boisterous sports were prohibited to the end that good manners might be cultivated in the playrooms the girls observed the strictest etiquette and discipline was maintained independent of oversight by teachers mercante could hardly believe however that the decorum was more than external later when the girls broke up they were found in pairs or small groups in corners on benches beside the pillars arm in arm or holding hands what they were speaking of could be surmised Quote, their conversation and confidences came to me indirectly they were sweethearts talking about their affairs in spite of the spiritual and feminine character of these unions one element was active the other passive thus confirming the authorities on this matter garnier regie lombroso bonfili unquote. mercante found the points of view of the two members of each pair to be quite different in moral aspect quote, one takes the initiative she commands she cares for she offers she gives she makes decisions she considers the present she imagines the future she smooths over difficulties gives encouragement and inspiration to her companion the other obeys accepts is docile gives way in matters of dispute and expresses her affection with sweet words and promises of love and submission the atmosphere silent and quiet was however charged with jealousy squabble desires illusions dreams and lamentations unquote. mercante's informant assured him that practically every girl had her affinity and that there were at least twenty well-defined love affairs the active party starts the conquest by making eyes next she becomes more intimate and finally proposes women being highly adaptable the nail fit unless she is rebellious gets into the spirit of it all if she is not complacent she must prepare for conflict because the prey becomes more desirable the more the resistance encountered opportunity was offered to mercante to observe some of the correspondence between the girls though of indifferent training and ability in other respects the girls speak and write regarding their affairs with most admirable diction and style no data are given regarding the actual intimate relations between the girls and of appendix b end of studies in the psychology of sex volume two by havelock ellis